Hello and welcome to this special CUBE conversation. I'm John Furrier, host of the CUBE here in Palo Alto, California. We got two great guests, a remote interview here, talk about generative AI and using AI for legacy migrations and taking advantage of the modernization opportunities that AI is driving, codeless opportunities to move those legacy migrations and modernize them for the, for the, for the future of the new application environments developing on top of cloud. We have Chris Casey, Director and General Manager of Industry and Technology Partnerships with AWS Amazon Web Services, and Gary Hoberman, Founder and CEO of Uncork, to talk about how to move those migrations into the cloud, but also modernize them, up, up level them big time. Gentlemen, thanks for, for coming on theCUBE conversation. Thanks for having us. Thanks for having us. Chris and Gary, I wanted to um, have this conversation to really get into some of the advances that general AI is happening. Obviously we see the hype of ChatGPT that shows the ubiquity of the, the whole rest of the world seeing the magic of the future of AI, but the really it's been around for a long time with AWS and others, but it's generating opportunities to step function areas. One of them is this migration of say mainframes or COBOL or old legacy environments that still power a lot of the IT, but need to be upgraded, but modernized, but not necessarily replaced. Chris, this is something that you guys got going on with Uncork, your partner. Talk about this phenomenon, why this opportunity for IT managers, CISOs and CIOs to take advantage of this usable up gen AI opportunities today to set this migration modernization. Yeah, uh, firstly, John, thanks very much for the time. and. You know, listen, uh, AI and ML is, is not something that's new to Amazon or AWS. You know, it's been in the foundation of what we do best in terms of applying it to real world scenarios. And, you know, we've got more than 100,000 customers who are using a AWS's ML services. Uh, one of the things that we've recently launched, uh, you know, is Amazon Bedrock. Uh, and really what we're aiming to do there is to democratize access uh, to some of this technology, to any builder and any developer that's trying to um, build on behalf of customers uh, on the AWS cloud. Obviously that might mean that some of those developers are building brand new solutions, um, some of which we probably haven't even imagined yet. Uh, but a lot of the time those developers are actually innovating uh, and either migrating or trying to enhance legacy systems. Uh, and really part of what we're excited about with our partner network uh, is really deeply partnering with those entities and working backwards from our customer needs uh, to identify industry specific solutions that really help solve uh, some of those challenges and move some of those workloads from on-prem um, you know, databases and data centers uh, into the cloud while also in improving the user experience. You know, one of the things that Amazon and cloud has proven during the pandemic, people looking back, and this is a common theme we're hearing at every event we go to from the leaders, the folks that were in the cloud before the pandemic hit took advantage of a tailwind and not a headwind. And that was a huge advantage for those companies. With AI, we're seeing a similar dynamic where people are recognizing if they don't get into the AI infrastructure aspect of it, they might be flat footed if the scale and speed of change continues to be the pace. In other words, the sooner you get in, the more you can take advantage of the opportunities. This is clearly something that's happening. A lot of in this conversation is going on. Gary, you founded a company that's in the, I would say the big time tailwind with Uncork. You guys have a unique opportunity um, with AI to change the game. Take a minute to explain Uncork, why you exist, where this idea came from and, and what your current status is. Yeah, you know, thanks, John. And it's a pleasure being on here and with Chris and Amazon, the partnership's been incredible. Agree completely in the pandemic showed how we could actually use technology, digitize, move faster. But what we did at Uncork was very unique and different. So I was an engineer on Wall Street back in 94, creating and coding systems. And I did that for many years until I became a global Fortune 50 CIO. And suddenly I started to live with the results of that code, meaning you're, you're an engineer, you're coding, you really don't care who's going to pick it up when you leave. But the reality is the company does. And what I kept seeing was as more and more code was produced, it was almost like this immense mountain that was created. And that mountain got bigger and bigger till the point it was 80% of my budget. And the budget was over a billion a year. I was responsible for an influencing 9 billion a year of spend. And I left that world, the corporate world, to see there's got to be a better way. And we have to not only stop the bleeding of the new technologies, like you're saying, the digital transformations, but how do you address that mountain that was built up, the legacy? And when you think about it, programming itself, a language, it's a language. And that's what generative AI is talking about. That's what it does. 
there's been 9,000 different programming languages created since the existence to talk to a machine. And machines don't understand language. They understand data and binary. So codeless to us is a simple concept. We removed all aspects of grammar, syntax, all the, all the things that make a language look like ancient Greek to someone. We made it look like a democratized, simple data definition, which is timeless. And that's what the beauty of what on Quark is running on Amazon. And this idea of generative AI being able to now take and tackle all of this 9,000 different languages into a unified data definition and end it going forward means reduction in costs, st speed to market, all the things everyone's been dying to get to with technology, the promise of it. Yeah, and, I, and my mental models, I think about COBOL, I mentioned that, we were talking about that before we came on. You know, it's, a little, it's still powering a lot of applications, you know, banks or whatever. Give an example of this AI powering approach, because I mean, it makes so much sense. I'm trying to visualize it. What, give me an example of how it works and how it's playing out for you guys. Yeah, and when you think about COBOL, so assembler was an abstract, COBOL was an abstraction of assembler and you could think about Java and you know all this abstraction layers we've been going on. The best abstraction we all know is the cloud. It's what Amazon did. It's what, and um, the reality is what cloud did was said, hey, there's a software defined infrastructure. That's what cloud is, but it stops at the infrastructure. It never addressed the applications, COBOL, the actual apps that are being built, the green screens that are there. And when you take it up to the next level, as we did with Uncork, and with this utility that sits above the cloud, what you start to see is you could actually understand the meaning of these applications and describe them in terms of readable data, democratized data. And an example would be as you could take an onboarding application at a bank or maybe in a, a insurance application or underwriting application, or you walk in a hospital, uh, federal government's a new customer. John, my favorite example was um, we refactored into Uncork an uh, entire COBOL system for New York City for marriage licenses, and we became the books and records marrying 38,000 people last year and the year before during COVID. So it's, it's digitizing, and it's it's a great example. I was I was one of those people, let's just say, going through this, but uh, and it worked brilliantly. But um, but when you think about what it can do, that's the beauty of it. And John, like what people don't understand is like when you're creating software today it's about 20% of your budget and 80% is running it after. So everyone thinks the finish line is we're live. Right. Like we're live, great, finish line. The reality is it's when the hell starts. It's like, that's the pain, the suffering, the the and we're looking to end that with Amazon. That's where we're saying there's a better future coming. I can imagine the sales calls are pretty easy. Hey, I'm going to come in and help you guys out. Door, come on in, no one's brought a solution like this before. This is a game changer and I can appreciate what you're doing there, because I can imagine the impact that you have in these meetings. And, but the question comes up, you know, and with these legacy apps, do you maintain it or do you innovate it? And it used to be mutually exclusive, right? Like, do we maintain it or do we completely rewrite it? This, you're kind of coming at it and saying, no, no, we can do both. You can maintain it into the cloud while innovating it in real time and then giving them the choice to use the higher level services, say on AWS, to add stuff to it. Can you, is that, am I getting that right? Is that the core issue? You could, you're absolutely right. Could you imagine being able to drag in all the bedrock features and services? Uh, we have an amazing demo with an image talk getting generated from Dolly, but then giving it to AWS Reconcile and getting back, recognize and getting back all the information on the image. And, and we're basically scoring Dolly to see how well it did. But um, in reality, John, when you think about bringing in the best of technologies, so you're just like, that's where this relationship comes. And most importantly, what we're embracing and our success today is what we call enabling business-led IT transformation. And this is the like taboo gotcha, let's just call it, John, which is the, the controversy, who leads IT? And who's, the reality is business leads IT because they control the budget, the requirements, the, the ways. What we do with Uncork and Amazon is we enable the business to participate in software development, actually take an active role. Maybe they own the rules, maybe they own, and no longer this bureaucracy built up of walls between the groups. We bring them together for the first time. Yeah, it really is an innovation story as well as a business value. It's really incredible. Chris, you know, I kind of get tingly because Dave Vellante and I have been talking you know, in years, going back to say 2015, 2016 timeframe. And we were kind of, people stared at us like, what are you talking about? We were saying, you know, the cloud's horizontally scalable. You get the scale with the cloud. 
but the data is where the vertical specialization is, industries, you have domain expertise. You're starting to see that now with Uncork and these examples at Amazon where all of a sudden it's been like this enlightenment moment or this explosion of, wow, I get it now. It's like it's clicking. AI is now the app that sits on top of the cloud so that the domain experts can apply their data in whatever way they want to protect themselves, but also innovate. This is like brand new. I mean, it wasn't, wasn't as strong a couple of years ago. It's now clicking into high gear. Do you agree? What's your reaction to that? And what's your, what's your view of, you must have the same feeling of, you know, it's finally happening. It's happening big time. I do, and it's really exciting, John. I mean, I don't think we've even scratched the surface on the use cases that eventually can be unlocked here. And I think really what we're seeing is part of the, the recent launches you've seen from AWS is democratizing access to some of this technology. Uh, and certainly there are you know, a lot of foundational models uh, available. Uh, there's a lot of different large language models, but um, you know, a lot of them are not a one size fits all strategy. So really what we've been working with our partners like Uncork is to make sure, you know, they're following sort of a, a mental model of four key pillars. One of which is specializing. So identifying very specific industry use cases uh, and workloads that they see that generative AI can actually help those customers uh, innovate and change the status quo of maybe how a business process has been done before. Then familiarizing with the right foundational models. Uh, as I said, they're not all one size fits all and sometimes they need to be uh, tailored for a specific use case to drive the right business outcomes. Uh, then get to building. Uh, and I think like, you know, a lot of our customers are very eager to start to run proof of concepts to actually try this out and figure out where it fits into their business processes. Uh, and really the third part of that is that customer engagement. You know, we don't know all of the potential capabilities that this technology can bring. and you know, I think with generative AI, it's actually potentially changing the definition of a developer to Gary's point. You know, the business can now get much more involved in iterating on different potential user experiences, which is really, really exciting. Uh, but that means the different permutations of where a solution might end up in terms of its uh, state and the user experience is excitingly variable in, in, in that vein. Uh, and certainly companies that are even looking further beyond that as to, okay, we've got a different user experience that we're putting into production, how are we then thinking about maintaining that solution to Gary's point long-term uh, is going to pay dividends into the future if they're thinking that far in advance. Yeah, and the democratization angle is interesting. The data science went through this same thing. Oh, you've got to be a, a unique person to be a data scientist. Now that got democratized here, machine learning. You have to be really unique. Now you can democratize it with the cloud and you can see examples here. Gary, I want to get back to the codeless idea. I like this idea of codeless because what you're implying is, is that voice could be doing, hey computer, you know, it's like very Star Trek like, you know, give me, <laughs> give me more power, Scotty, kind of thing. So enterprises have debt, technical debt. You mentioned that earlier. Talk about the fact that you might have to run these legacy apps and then all of a sudden the regulations change. You're seeing regulations all over the world around locating in certain regions or applications that have, might have privacy issues whatever they are, there's new regulations. How do you bolt that on? And this is something that I see as an opportunity. How do you guys look at getting rid of that tech stack to modernize for the, for, the, for the regulations and or changes that got to be coded into the apps? You know, John, myself and my team worked in highly regulated industries our whole life. And it's where we started on Quark. It's really like, when we talk about on Quark, it's like, yes, after you're live in production, it's a 65% reduction in your cost and 100 times less bugs. We have eight times less defects than Linux operating system when we go live. That's the results. But what you're describing is why we created Uncork, which is imagine, imagine the world where in a codeless world, there's no more code generated, there's no more code allowed. And this was the premise why we built Uncork, which was if we could eliminate code, what it means is the upgrade path. So getting you onto the next version of Uncork become something of a click of a button with no risk. So for example, we've upgraded since 2019 on Quark 320 times, 320 version upgrades without a single customer ever knowing. But the beauty of that means all customers from Goldman Sachs and the finance side and CVS and then healthcare through the federal government, HHS through New York City, they're all running on the same version. They're all running on the same code base, which means we're almost like a bubble a protective container. So at the bubble level, 
What we're doing is we're the ones facing security requirements, ethical hacking, penetration testing, same as cloud, same as Chris does with Amazon. But it means at the bubble level, we're SOC 2, Type 2, Privacy Shield, GDPR compliant, Privacy 2020, FedRAMP certified and announced two weeks ago, authorized to operate in federal government, HIPAA compliant, WORM compliant, ISO compliant, which means we we launched a... um, an HR startup launched entirely on Uncork and Amazon about two weeks ago. It was the, it went through the ethical hack with flying colors, not a single issue. And first time, I've never seen it done. That's the beauty is you could actually take out all of the, the concerns, the security testing, all from the customer and move it to us. Talk, Chris, talk about the dynamics relationship and the dynamics with AWS because I mean, think about Gen 1 of cloud, you know, Dropbox, Airbnb, they're SaaS applications, ISVs, and you are too, I guess, by, by Adam Selesky's definition. But you're really kind of building on top of Amazon's hyperscale infrastructure investment. I mean, you're taking advantage of all that work that they did. That's kind of like a super application. It's a super, because you're essentially a legacy software app that's putting a wrapper around these capabilities and handling for everything for the customer. I mean, you're leveraging AWS. What's the Amazon connection there? Because I mean, you're essentially an extension of AWS by default because you're sitting on top of them. We we are, a le- the way we view ourselves, just what you said, John, we're, we're a boring infrastructure layer on top of cloud. And uh, most of our clients are AWS clients. And that's been a focus. We have others on other providers, but smaller numbers. It, but it means with AWS, we have the ability to bring in every single one of their tools instantly. So yeah. private, we could do private links so that we're actually behind the scenes, secure and connected to firewalls. You have the, um, of course, the whole bedrock concept of AI tools coming in. We have uh, one of the biggest mortgage companies is working with us in Amazon using AppFlow, which is the entire engine of actually how do you integrate and orchestrate and it is beautiful when you see it working and tying together. So, so the relationship there is we're able to bring their tools and developer tools into a codeless world for others to just drag and drop and use for the first time. You're a, you're a cloud without having the infrastructure. Amazon's the, the cloud, you're the ISV. I mean, the lines are blurring, Chris, when you have this kind of next gen capability, they're got so much power. This is the benefit of the neck, this kind of next level of, of AWS because you have all kinds of data protection now with these AI. One of the biggest concerns right now is privacy and intellectual property. Bedrock has the capability to manage data on VPCs. All that's under the covers. So the speed game is okay. This is a huge, unique, nuanced point. Can you guys talk about this, this speed game? Because Amazon's set up with Bedrock to do first party, third party, and long tail open source. So like all the models are running, <laughs> running there. Yeah, I, I mean, sp- speed does vis- disproportionately matter in general, John, and especially in this space. And I think you, you you just hit the nail on the head there. You know, the the lines are a little bit gray in terms of AWS services and partner solutions, and ultimately, that's actually great for end customers. You know, one of the the key aspects of, you know, what we're trying to bring with our partner network and even the AWS marketplace, which I know you're very familiar with, John, is the end customers are looking for complete solutions to help solve their business problems here they're not really looking for a piecemeal where they have to put it together themselves. So the more that we can uh, really improve that experience for an end customer where yes, they might be leveraging the preview of Amazon bedrock in terms of accessing those underlying uh, foundational models, but you know, maybe the customer doesn't even know that that's powering some of the user experience that they're seeing as they're iterating on an app application with Uncork. Uh, you know, ultimately that is bettering the end customer outcome there. Chris, talk about the, the 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 option with Bedrock and Amazon with from the data perspective. If you're going to be managing the legacy modernization path, you got to have that option. I mean, that's the biggest fear right now with these generative AI techniques is, where's my IP? Where's the data? Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, and certainly we take we take that very seriously. Uh, and certainly the way we've designed Bedrock is allowing customers to. Uh, access these foundational models through an API. Um, They can uh, point those models to certain data that's sitting in their AWS environments and get the results uh, from those models uh, without having to worry about that IP, um, you know, 
extending beyond their AWS environment, which is really critical when you're talking about some of these enterprise applications for generative AI. And certainly, John, that is certainly one of the questions that I get asked most from customers when they're thinking about the utility of this new technology. And they sort of understand it from sort of a social you and I playing around with something like ChatGPT. But the, the next frontier from an enterprise application, that's certainly very much front of mind for customers. And certainly from our side, it's not only just the Amazon story and sort of how we secure our services and the cloud itself, but working with partners, and Gary mentioned a whole bunch of certifications that Uncork have to make sure that the security of the data in the cloud is still first and foremost at the front of mind for our partners and the end customers too. Gary, you know, John, your, you know your peers, they think in the same thing. You got which foundation model to choose. What's your, what's your angle on this whole uh, <laughs> IP data? Where's that store? What's your, what's your reaction? Yeah, I mean, we always get that question because we have, um, we're OEM'd in a lot of other software you would never know existed today where they're using us uh, behind the scenes or even in front to, face the customer. So we designed it. And when you think about leveraging Amazon and, and the work that Chris mentioned, we designed Uncork to be single tenant because cloud has basically taken away the reason to be multi-tenant, which is a risk. Multi-tenant is this, it's a potential security risk depending on how you actually do it. To us, we're single tenant, which means the customer gets to own the encryption key to their IP and their data that's unique to them, which means there's no keys to the kingdom behind the scenes. That is the most secure model. And, and we like to, you know, when you think about what that means is we can now store data for customers, okay. PII data we're storing for banks and socials and data births. We're able to store that very securely with all the regulation and compliance needed okay. in the Amazon bedrock, in the actual Amazon services here. Um, if someone wants to upload a W2 document, we're storing it in S3 buckets behind the scenes, and then we're making sure it's worm compliant, right? Once read many. And it's that relationship between the app and the cloud, which was missing all these years. When you think about cloud migration, when I was there at the earliest days when I was a Citigroup MD seeing cloud come in and, and I watched a server move from under the desk to a data room, to a data center, to the cloud. <laughs> and the whole concept of that progression and abstraction was, the beauty, let us do the work for you as a service. Like that's, so we've taken it with Chris just up to the next level is let us store your data. We have a, a new feature coming out, John, it's auto indexing. Let us auto index your data based on usage as opposed to where you think and yeah. get better. That's the benefits working with, with us and Amazon. I mean, soon AI was generally AI is going to have all certifications for Amazon in any way, Chris. It's like, you know, I mean, it really is a wonderful thing if done right and it's a data problem and opportunity, you manage the data, accurate data in, you get outcomes. So it's input, inputs are huge in this, uh, Gary, right? You got to have the right inputs with the data because the outputs will take care of itself if you handle it properly. This is why I think I like the bedrock approach because you can handle the inputs and engineer and architect that. Absolutely. And you know, think about how much paper you as a consumer are still seeing in your, your life. As much as we read about generative AI, you walk to a doctor's office, you're handed a pen and paper. And so, like the beauty is, you know, with with the solution with Amazon on Quark, we could tackle those transformations that are still paper. And now you could use generative AI to ask those questions yeah. and get the responses as you're saying, the accuracy back. There's a great book uh, called uh, The Score Will Take Care of Itself by Bill Walsh. He focused on the inputs, not the output. He didn't care about the scoreboard, he cared about what was the inputs. I think we always love sports analogies. So that's kind of the data AI game right now. It's not so much trying to replicate the large language models, it's get the inputs done, take advantage of the different foundation models. And that seems to be a great approach. You guys are doing great. Um, I guess my final question to both of you guys, Gary in particular, is what's next for Uncork? Where are you now? What's going to happen next? Because if you continue to do this, you're going to be the legacy cloud. You can just be like, everyone come to you, ingest everything, and I, you're going to modernize all the legacy apps. John, like I, I built Uncork to fix the mess I left. With. I, I, I saw it for 25 years. I mean, I was like, that was the, the reason I went there was that. And um, and what would be left is to actually make cloud migration successful because like the idea of a data center still being needed, you know, it, it's a company that's confused in many ways to say, why is that their strategic advantage? So the, that's where like, to me, the excitement is actually changing an industry. We know codeless is the future of all software. It is as clear as day to all of us. And we see that that's the future coming. And to me, the future really becomes when as a consumer, you know, my son passes his driver's test, he just did. 
I should have got a text automatically from DMV saying, congrats, and by the way, we see you have Geico. Would you like us to add him to your policy? That's the world. I'm in. That's where I want to get to. I'd get many speeding tickets for sure. I, my insurance would go up for sure. John, we're watching your every moves, rolling through those stop signs in California. Um, Chris, your take real quick. I know you got a lot on your mind and a lot on your plate with a lot of these industries. Is it the same pattern in all the different industry uh, partnerships you have that's scale everywhere kicking in? Is that Gen AI wake up call here? Same pattern, uh, different use cases, uh, starting to get very specific too. And I think each of the customers in all of the, the industries, one of the things they all have in common, they're very excited to reap the benefits of this and they're very eager to get started. Uh, and really from, from our perspective, we think partners are very much critical for AWS to mutually bring that value proposition for those customers. Um, and you know we're ready to support our partners and customers through proof of concepts and funding and our working backwards approach to make sure what we're building is going to deliver the outcomes they expect. Yeah. Um, but yeah, certainly the, the commonality across the industry is they're eager to, eager to get started and eager to reap the benefits. Um, the devil's in the detail though, in terms of which foundational models are right, how you customize them and tweak them for the specific use case that you have in your specific industry. Uh, that's the exciting challenge ahead of us, but uh, it's going to be a fun ride over the next months. It feels like the early days of cloud, but a whole nother level of scale with AI, using AI for legacy. I love this conversation, AI and codeless. Gary, I'll give you the last word, last minute. Give the pitch for Uncork, for the folks watching out there that want to be customers that are, are swimming and sauteing in the frog and boiling water going, oh my God, I got this legacy. What do I do? What's your pitch uh, for Uncork? Yeah. We democratize technology without compromising enterprise. And it's through Codeless, which is another way of saying we convert programming language to data or data-driven software. And that's that's the future is data-driven software. Data is the best asset in the world. We make it your biggest asset in your company. It's all about the data. Chris, Gary, really appreciate you coming on this special CUBE conversation, Generative AI that continues the conversation. We'll be talking about this for a long, long time. We're going to continue to talk about it. Thank you for spending the time and coming on the CUBE conversation. Really appreciate it. Thank you for having us. Okay, Thank you, I'm, John. I'm John Furrier, host of theCUBE. We're here in Palo Alto, California for a CUBE Conversation. Thanks for watching.